Uh, Guy Rolnick today is, uh, by no doubt, the most influential <coughs> economics and business journalist in Israel. In the last uh, 28 years, if I'm not mistaken, Guy was covering uh, this intersection of business, finance, media, regulation, government, and politics. Uh, Guy is also a professor in the Booth Business School in Chicago University and taught several classes uh, in Tel Aviv University, uh, the Interdisciplinary Center in Erzalia about uh, political economics, um, and got multiple awards for his journalistic works. Um, more importantly for today, in the previous years, Guy became what we would call a policy entrepreneur. And by that I mean a person who uses his uh, media influence in order to promote a public agenda that deals with the most, I would say, fundamental, complicated, sometimes unpopular problems uh, in Israel's economy. We uh, invited Guy uh, today because we found his story very inspiring, inspiring from, for uh, several reasons. First of all, for showing uh, personal courage as the leader of uh, the leading uh, Israeli um, business newspaper and media outlet, going after sometimes big business in promoting this important agenda of inequality, of lack of competition in the, in the Israeli economy, of this um, connection between big business and regulation, just imagine the Wall Street Journal, you know, promoting in, you know, dealing with a lack of competition in the American economy. So that was the first thing. The second thing, he successfully introduced into uh, Israel's public agenda topics that usually are not on the agenda. Usually in Israel, the agenda is about the conflicts between uh, left and right, secular and religious, uh, Sephardic and Ashkenazi, and Guy brought his topics into the agenda, the public agenda, and most importantly, he actually made a difference and made the regulators um, change things. The anti-concentration law that I'm sure he's gonna talk about is the proof of his success, bringing these things to the agenda and then influencing government and regulator through this. So Guy, the podium is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Guy, very much for this uh, nice uh, uh, introduction. I am really thrilled and excited to, to give this talk uh, 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 this talk uh, today, and I'm grateful for the Nazarian uh, Center for Israel uh, Studies for taking this uh, uh, initiative. And I used to run uh, uh, I used to run a big conference business in Israel, and so I know what is a keynote, and I also know what does it mean to talk after lunch. <laughs> in professional terms, it's called the graveyard slot. <laughs> so uh, not only that, but uh, we're talking. There are going to be some slides with numbers, so I apologize in advance for giving numbers and specifically right after uh, lunch, but I think it's important. So as a, as a, a guy mentioned, uh, most of my career is in journalism. So uh, uh, I founded Israel's leading financial newspaper, The Marketer, uh, 17, uh, 17 uh, years ago, then later used it to drive reforms in the Israeli political economy and Israel capital markets and so on. And so I used to give a lot of talks. I've been going around the country. I teach in several universities in Israel. And I've been lecturing and talking a lot about the Israeli economy and what should be done and policy and so on. Uh, uh, four, uh, four, years, uh, four years ago, I uh, went more into academia, first in Harvard, and now I'm, uh, I joined the faculty of the University of uh, of the University of Chicago. So in Israel, I give, I talk about the Israeli economy. In the, US, in the US, I teach classes and do research on uh, political economy of the US and specifically regulation and media. And today, I'm going to try, well, it's uh, one of the first time that I'm doing it, to bring this uh, together. So I do apologize, I don't have 30 years uh, uh, track record in bringing those, th those uh, th uh, things together. But I will try uh, and, uh, with you and bear with me for the next 20 minutes or so to look at the political economy of Israel and at the political economy of the United States. I would like to be uh, 
as my fellow Israelis know, I would like to be a little bit provocative and give you food for, food for thoughts. We have only uh, 20, 30 minutes for the presentation and then a, a, a conversation with, with, uh, with Tal. Uh, if you have a lot of technical questions about the numbers, because I'm going to say a few uh, 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 surprising things about U.S. economy, about Israel economy, I'd be more than happy to take uh, questions uh, later and then uh, offline after we finish this, uh, uh, after I'm uh, done. So, so uh, I started uh, 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 giving talks in the U.S. Uh, five or ten years ago, and, you know, I realized uh, very, very fast that there is demand for three kinds of stories about Israel. The first story is the story that we all cherish and love, young country so successful with so many enemies. The second, uh, the second story is uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflicts and whatever uh, it's around it. And the third story that emerged in the last 10 years, 15 years, the story of startup nations. Now, these are great stories. Everybody loves to tell them. Everybody loves to listen to them. And it's like, a, you know, I, I, you can't even call it a cottage industry. It's a huge industry that tells those stories. There's a lot of demand and supply on this side. But it is time maybe also to move forward and talk and uh, create a new narrative for Israel, a narrative that some of you are already involved in. This is a narrative of Israel actually is a very advanced industrial country, part of the OECD uh, club with, just give you the, I'll show you the numbers soon. GDP per capita in Israel is uh, at par with some of the leading uh, countries in, 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 in Europe. We are an advanced industrial uh, 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 economy. Not many politicians and not many people that come out of Israel and come to the United States like to, uh, they, they do talk about uh, startup uh, a nation, about their success. But they also want everybody to believe that this, we are such a unique story, different than whatever happens all over the world. And actually, this is not the case. Most challenges that the Israeli economy have today are not that different from all the challenges that you see in the United States and its Europe. And I will go into uh, uh, details uh, uh, soon. Now I realize that I'm flipping. Uh, only in my, uh, uh, so I'm going to have to use uh, two computers here because I have a Mac and this is it, but so I hope it'll be uh, 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 synced here. Okay, so I'll start with this amazing uh, 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 analysis done by the New York Times two years ago. Overhaul of Israel's economy offers lessons for the United States. Wouldn't you believe that? Okay, so Israel now, economic policy in Israel. Uh, people in the New York Times, this is a professor of law and economics, uh, are looking into what we've done in Israel, and I'll go later into details, and see what have these guys have been doing uh, uh, in Israel in the past five or ten years. This was, uh, this is a January 2014. Uh, I think that today, after the last elections, and in the last two years, this might be more, it's already becoming more and more relevant and you will see later that in the, Amer in the U.S. Uh, uh, discourse of what's happening in the United States, you'll see more and more of those ideas that we started talking about them uh, uh, in Israel uh, two years ago. So very quickly, you know that those are to totally, uh, in terms of size, the United States is much, much uh, 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 bigger in terms of the population and, of course, in terms of the overall uh, 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 GDP. But if you look at the... Uh, GDP per capita, as I mentioned uh, uh, before, we are in the same uh, uh, neighborhood as most of the OECD uh, 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 countries. Now, look at this amazing. Actually, I, I prepared this, this, this entire presentation. I prepared in the last three weeks for this, uh, for this specific event. And I was struck. I knew that this is, these are the numbers, more or less, but I was struck by uh, uh, by some of those numbers. So this is GDP per capita, which is the best gauge that economists have for uh, quality of life. We know there is a lot of problems with this uh, 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 metrics, but it's, it's what we use. And so when we look at PPP, by the way, is just mumbo jumbo of the economies. It's a purchasing power parity. It uh, has to do with uh, uh, the exchange, uh, the difference in the exchange rates. When you look, when you adjust for that, uh, Israeli economy, GDP, quality of life in Israel has gone up 
47% in the last decade versus 26 in the United uh, States. Actually, if it's not PPP, it, the, the, the gap is even, uh, is even uh, uh, bigger. Now, let it look at uh, the median wage. This is not average, this is median, and we know now, everybody knows after the last five years that there is so much discussion on inequality all over the world, we know why uh, median is the important uh, metric. So this is Israel's median uh, monthly uh, uh, wage, and it's grew uh, in, in dollar terms almost uh, uh, 60%. This is America, this is the United States. Okay, in the United States it's only 30%. But, this is in dollar terms, and if we, this is inflation in, in the same period of time, and if you bring them uh, together, so actually as you, uh, anybody who reads the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the FT or any decent newspaper uh, by now knows that median income in the United States has stagnated in the last 10 and even 30, and uh, 30 years. And the most striking way to describe it is that the uh, average income of the middle class male uh, men in the United States today is lower than his father's when he was in the same age. So these are the American, uh, uh, the American uh, 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 numbers. So uh, very quickly, uh, uh, this is, so Israel and the United States in terms of the World Economic Forum looks at the competitiveness. We are again in the, in the same, uh, in the same uh, club. And even when we talk about corruption, uh, I can go into deeper in that what is corruption, what is the perception of corruption if we have enough time, but we are not that different than other countries. The United States had a big problem of, uh, uh, of a, fin a financial crisis seven years ago. We know that uh, all banks were uh, deemed too, too big to fail. And we sort of thought that we're dealing with that, but actually even after the financial crisis, we still have a much too much concentrated concentration. The financial system uh, grew even rapidly. At the end of the day, United States, it's all about five big banks that control more than 50% of the market. In, the United, in, in Israel, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, three banks, and we'll get back to that when we talk about uh, uh, the reforms. And of course, uh, these are the charts that you see uh, uh, all the time. GDP did grow in the United States in the last 10 or 30 years. We had uh, amazing uh, productivity revolution in many places and so on. But as we know, most of the income, most of the growth, uh, was not, it was not shared with uh, most of the society, but rather with the 1%, the 10%, or the 0.1%. Uh, 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 percent. And now this is uh, uh, in the discourse. Uh, so let's look at uh, Israel six or seven years ago when, as a uh, guy uh, kindly said, Guy Oronim, who introduced me. So uh, the marker, which is the newspaper that I founded, uh, started an informative campaign about what happens when uh, politics is controlled by special interests, all kind of special interests, and especially uh, uh, big money. And people were becoming more and more uh, uh, aware of what happens when you have such concentration of wealth and mostly more than wealth concentration of power. Uh, in Israel, we had uh, five or six large conglomerates uh, that are built like pyramids that control a vast amount of the economy. Uh, if any of you, uh, you know, uh, these days we are, uh, uh, Israel uh, uh, public broadcasting is, uh, is broadcasting a series that I did with uh, uh, Israeli documentary film uh, producer, uh, director named Doron Sabari about the political economy of Israel's largest bank. This is a series that started airing last, uh, uh, last uh, week. Uh, it's, a, it's a story of 20 years of uh, what happened in Israel's largest bank and largest conglomerate. Together, uh, those two companies were controlled by people that eventually were deemed uh, not very decent, not very honest, and actually not very rich. They were highly leveraged. Uh, one of them actually was uh, uh, bankrupt for many years, but together they controlled 25 to 30 percent of the financial, uh, the entire financial assets in Israel for many, many years. So this is the situation in Israel seven, eight, and nine uh, uh, years ago when we were starting our, uh, uh, our campaign. 
this is a good quote that I'd like to give. While we were working on uh, dealing with this uh, concentrated, uncompetitive, crony uh, structure of Israeli economy, this is a, a story that was in the Financial Times describing the problem in Israeli political economy and why markets are not competitive and why we are not uh, uh, productive uh, uh, enough. Now, so this is Israel, and later with uh, the help with Tal, we'll talk about what we've done in Israel. Now, these are some of the quotes that I took off randomly from the internet. Uh, uh, so I, I, I always start with, this, with the first uh, quote because I like Warren Buffett and because this is uh, taken, out of, uh, uh, taken out of a uh, long interview. I spent a lot of time with Buffett uh, in the last 10 years and uh, I, I, I once asked him, this is 2011, uh, when I was traveling with him in the, in the Far East, I asked him about, is, can we talk about plutocracy? You know, plutocracy is uh, not a democracy but uh, a country that is run by big money. And he says, yes, we are drifting towards, uh, towards uh, uh, plutocracy. So this is Bernie Sanders, that you know, his net asset value is $70 billion. You, you don't expect to hear that, but you do hear that. And then you have, of course, Bernie Sanders. And actually, in the last election, I don't know if you follow the rhetorics of the last election, but it was Ted Cruz and Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. Actually, everybody said that uh, special interests are controlling uh, controlling uh, U.S. Uh, Congress, U.S. policies, and so on. And uh, the guy that I really like to quote is not uh, such a young guy anymore. He's, he's reaching 80, but this is a conservative, conservative, important judge, one of the leading scholars in law and economics at the University of Chicago, uh, Richard Posner. Uh, I had him, <coughs> I had him in, the, in my center in Chicago a while ago, and he said the real corruption of his... Uh, in the U.S. economy today is the ownership of Congress by the rich and hence the ownership of many of the economic uh, policies by uh, uh, special, uh, uh, special uh, interests. These are the numbers that you all know. Uh, we sort of take it for granted, okay? This is life. Life is about lobbying. This is how politics works. But uh, actually, so this is the amount of money uh, special interests and corporations uh, use every year to influence. This is just lobbying, does not include campaign contribution. And actually, it is a formerly $3 billion uh, uh, industry, but actually it's much, much uh, uh, bigger. If you go deeper, you see that this is just the tip of the iceberg. Below the iceberg, there is a huge industry that is focused on subverting uh, democracy and subverting open and competitive uh, uh, open and com competitive markets. Look at this, okay? So this is the amount of lobbying done in Israel, and this is the amount of lobbying done in the United States, where you know, we still have, have, uh, have a long way uh, to, go, and I to go, and I would argue uh, today that we are not uh, uh, continuing in the trajectory that we were until six or seven years ago of more and more uh, special uh, interest and, and, and money in uh, in, uh, in politics. Now, this is an amazing, it's sort of for, for people who are, who know, good, uh, who have good acquaintance with, uh, with the Israeli economy, Israeli society, it might not be that of a surprise, but uh, I'll show you soon another uh, chart of what happens to life expectancy in the United States, and I think that some of you will be uh, uh, surprised. So, actually, life expectancy in Israel is much higher on average, even if you look at uh, at all stratums of, uh, of, uh, of the uh, society, uh, even you look at the Jews and the Arabs, the ultra Orthodox, and, uh, and so on. And I want to argue that there is a reason that we have life expectancy which is much higher, but before I'll go to, uh, to that, I'll show you this. So Angus Deaton, won the no he's an economist, they won the Nobel Prize two years ago. Uh, if you don't know the name, I do, uh, I recommend follow him. He's become more of a public intellectual in the last two years, but he's also a very serious and important economist. And he's been looking into what's happening in the healthcare system in the United States and its outcomes. And United States today, I don't know if you know, in terms of the, uh, uh, the, this stratum of uh, white male age 45 to 54 is actually the only Western country where life expectancy is decreasing. Okay, life expectancy is decreasing. It's not only decreasing in its ranking among all the 
Western economies, but it's also decreasing in, in uh, absolute, uh, in absolute uh, uh, terms. And there is a reason for that. There is a very good uh, reason to that. And I will say it bluntly, so you'll remember that uh, although I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm a professor from Chicago, I'm still an Israeli, and the United States has one of the worst healthcare systems in the world. The United States has the one of the most unequal healthcare systems in the, in, the, in the world. And what is most importantly, the United States has one of the most ineffective and inefficient healthcare system in the world. There are many, the OECD measures it, the, uh, uh, the World Health Organization. This one I like by Bloomberg that combines some of those uh, uh, indices. Look at the United States, ranks 50. Look at Israel, ranks uh, 7. Uh, you will find that uh, 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 there is a huge uh, uh, gap on of almost all the uh, parameters of the United States and, and Israel. So what is it about the United States health system that is so different than the Israeli one? And the answer is pretty simple. The United States healthcare system is designed mostly by special interests. You know those special interests as much as I do. It can be the hospitals, it can be the insurance companies, it can be medical devices, it can be pharma, it can be the AMA, all those uh, players, and this is the design of the system. There is a huge discussion in the United States about coverage, which is a very important uh, distributive question, but there is a much more important discussion that it's not uh, uh, being held with the efficiency and how the system is, uh, is uh, 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 designed. So now looking at the comparative between, uh, uh, comparison between Israel and the United States. So Israel was moving in many industries, in many policies in the last 20 years in the direction of the United States. Even in the healthcare system, we started bringing more and more for-profit considerations into healthcare. And this has stopped. This has stopped after we started dealing with the influence of big money, the tycoons, the conglomerates, the pyramid the insurance companies in our political system, in our democratic institutions. And four years ago, we stopped to a halt the privatization of our healthcare uh, uh, system, and we still remain now, some of you would say, you know what, why not with the two? Why not have some profit incentives in the healthcare system? So there is a moral question here, but there are also an economic questions. And what most economists would tell us is that healthcare system, healthcare, healthcare markets are unlike any other markets. They don't always respond very well in terms of, of uh, efficiencies and allocation to profit uh, 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 incentives because of the asymmetric information and because of other issues. Last year, Kenneth Aero, one of the most important economists in the history, in the last uh, century died. And actually, 50 or 60 years ago, uh, this economist that formalized a lot of Adam Smith, the guy who believed in invisible hand and free markets, Kenneth Aero, who formalized mathematically into models the ideas of why free markets are great, he's also the economist that told us, you know what? but don't, don't try to play with those models. Don't play, try to play with those ideas when you come to the, uh, to the healthcare uh, uh, system. This is some of the outcomes that we see in the healthcare system in the United States. You know, the amount of ban uh, personal bankruptcies, the amount of people who go under because of, uh, uh, of bills. I will end this story about what happens when you have special interests taking over uh, policy with a quote by another guy that I like to uh, read him. He is the partner of Warren Buffett, and unlike Buffett, which is a Democrat, he is a Republican, a conservative Republican, and, in name for, and a billionaire. And of, as, of course, I'm talking about uh, Charlie Munger. And I like his quote. This is a very recent quote, last month from the annual, uh, from the annual shareholder meetings in Omaha, Nebraska. He said, "Guys, we gotta get our act together. We need to do what every decent." other Western economy does, we should take out the profit motive from some of our healthcare system and bring in the single payer that everybody but the United States does. And the reason we can't do it, of course, is because of the capture 
of the political system by the uh, 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 by the uh, by the special uh, uh, interest and again uh, uh, numbers that are there. Okay, so what did we do in Israel? So what we did in Israel, we started a campaign. We started to push for reforms that will decrease the influence of uh, big money and vested interest in politics. So politicians and regulators can, do, can cater not only to special interests, not only to the rich, not only to the powerful inside government and outside of Israel, but to cater to the, uh, uh, to the public. So I know that uh, although you are, uh, uh, I don't know uh, most of you personally, I do know one thing about you, even before I put my uh, glasses on, is that you are all subscribers of AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile. And the reason that I know that is because between those three companies, they control something like 90% of the market. And I also know that when you have two players that have 60, 70% of the market, or three, if, uh, three players that have more than 80% of the market, I know this is not capitalism, this is not competition. So funnily enough, when you look at many industries in the United States, what you see actually is the very high concentration and very little, uh, very little competition. And capitalism is all about competition. If you take out, uh, if you take out uh, uh, competition from capitalism, you are left with nothing. And what you are left with actually is something that has, not, that has no uh, uh, legitimacy. And in many uh, industries in the United States, I don't want to talk about your cable television here, I'll talk about hospitals, or talk about the great United Airlines. I got here uh, by United Airlines, I was not beaten this time. Which is strange, because if they're smart, they know that they can beat me, and I'll still take United Airlines, because I live in uh, Chicago, and they control most of O'Hare. So they can beat me and drag me uh, down the aisle, and I'll still use uh, United Airlines, because they are in many, many uh, states here, a duopoly or part of a, an oligopoly. Now, let me tell you, which is sort of funny, because I'm an Israeli, and I'm here with an American, uh, with an American uh, crowd, and let me tell you that competition, competition works. And let me tell me, when you take out money from politics, it works, and I'll give you a simple uh, chart. I know how much you are paying for AT&T and Verizon, and I know what you're getting in terms of the broadband, in terms of the quality of pay. And so this is what you're paying. Uh, you're paying today about $45 uh, uh, per month. And it's pretty much it's like 5% less than what you paid uh, 10 years ago. But when you go to Israel, and some of you are Israelis, you know that prices in Israel dropped at least 50%. Why? And, so, uh, uh, for, and for some, for the weakest parts, of our society actually dropped 90% because they were heavily penalized before we bought in, uh, in competition. So how are we able to bring down prices of uh, uh, mobile uh, cell phones in Israel in anywhere between 50 to 90% in, uh, in the last five years? Very simple. We decreased the power, the political power of those large uh, players. We brought in, uh, we brought in uh, competition and prices uh, dropped in a heartbeat by uh, uh, 90, uh, uh, 90 uh, percent. Okay, uh, very quickly, uh, we'll talk about it if we have uh, uh, time. Housing in Israel is still very, very uh, 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 expensive, and college tuition is very, very expensive. We can talk about uh, 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 that uh, uh, also. Now, Israel, uh, uh, yeah. So Israel, as you know, has many disadvantages compared to the United uh, uh, States. First of all, we're stuck in the Middle East. It's not a great place uh, for a host of uh, 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 for a host of reasons. You know, I, I can say it now. I feel very, uh, uh, you know, I, I've been living in the last uh, two years in Chicago, so uh, you know, uh, I don't like the weather in Chicago. Also, so and now I'm in California. So, so we, we are stuck in the Middle East. We don't have any natural resources. Tal talked about uh, the, gas, uh, uh, the gas exploration in Israel, which is great, but it's not gonna, we are not gonna be Saudi Arabia or anything uh, uh, like that. We don't have serious 
uh, natural uh, uh, resources, and of course we have uh, uh, this rift between the right and the left, but still, you looked at the numbers, you saw the numbers, we are able uh, to do some uh, quite dramatic uh, uh, reforms in the last six or seven years, and you see the trajectory of the United States, you see what happens here in politics in the United States in the last two years. I think that Israel uh, did some uh, amazing uh, things on that uh, uh, front. I don't attribute it to the right or to the left. I, att I attribute a lot of it to the social protests in Israel and works of people like what we did in the market and other people that were pushing uh, to get uh, uh, social, uh, uh, social uh, uh, reforms. So here are the, some of the things that happened in, in Israel in the last six or seven years, which are different than what's happening in, uh, in the United States. So our inequality is not rising as fast as it was, uh, as, as fast as it is in the United States. You saw the mobile, it's now happening in other, in other uh, products and, uh, and services. Our healthcare system stopped this, uh, uh, this uh, privatization and uh, this uh, inequality. Uh, rising inequality, the economic concentration, which is a big issue in the United States today, is uh, falling in Israel. The power of big banks in Israel is now, uh, uh, is now also uh, decreasing, decreasing, and as I mentioned uh, 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 before, as I mentioned uh, 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 before, the power of uh, vested interest in big business, monopolies, cartels, uh, and other players in the market that are not creating value but sucking out uh, uh, value is, uh, is uh, decreasing. What did we do uh, technically? This is uh, what Guy uh, mentioned before, the anti-concentration legislation has, uh, uh, first of all, we do away with all those huge companies that are in many industries and that it can uh, collude. We do away with the possibility to have financial holdings and real uh, holdings, and now when the Israeli government does any kind of privatization, outsourcing any decision, it has to take also into consideration the role of competition and the role of uh, 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 the role of uh, uh, concent uh, uh, concentration. Now, what did we do in uh, in uh, in the marker? So uh, the marker led an editorial line critical of the economic system of the status uh, uh, quo. We use the 2008, 2009 financial uh, uh, crisis as a, as a moment of uh, ripeness to talk about those issues. How do we make markets more competitive? How do we really use what markets can give us in order to cater, in order to increase societal uh, 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 value? And we did it relentlessly for a very, very long uh, period of time. At some point, Prime Minister Netanyahu decided to uh, set up a concentration uh, committee. There was a lot of rebuttal from many, many big players in Israel, including the media that is controlled by people who enjoy those monopolistic uh, rents. But we didn't, give, uh, we didn't give up, and eventually this legislation uh, uh, was approved by the Knesset. The interesting thing about it is, for people who lived in the United States for so many years, is the following. This is, to quote the New York Times, one of the biggest pieces of economic legislation that was ever uh, approved in the Israeli uh, Knesset. And it was approved in the Israeli Knesset by the Israeli parliament with all parties in coalition supporting it. Zero people voted against it. Few abstained, everybody backed it. From Habayta Yehudi of Naftali Bennett to Meretz of Zehava Galhon, from Yesh Atid to uh, uh, Machanet Zioni Labor and Likud. Everybody was supporting it. Because once you get the public engaged and once you change the market for ideas, you can bridge those uh, uh, you can bridge those uh, 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 divides. And the law, as I said, was supported across all major uh, parties with no, uh, with no uh, 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 objection. This is some of the coverage of the work that we've done in the marker in pushing those, uh, in pushing those uh, reforms. This is the New York Times writing about those uh, reforms. And my uh, 
favorite quote, and I do apologize in advance, you know, uh, 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 describing what other people are saying about the work. I was specifically asked here to talk about what the activist uh, part of, uh, of our uh, work. So two years, uh, a year ago, one of the uh, magazine in the United States, a nation magazine, decided to, in the 150 year anniversary, <coughs> they had a big story on how to fix American journalism. And what they decided is to say, you know, they told the, the, the author of that piece said, uh, American media should look at what, how the role, the activist role that Israeli media, and spe specifically the marker, had in Israel in the last uh, uh, 10 years in pushing and changing public agenda in what is the agenda, what are you priming, and how are you framing it in order to create incentives for politicians and regulators uh, to do the uh, uh, to do the uh, the right uh, 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 the right uh, uh, things. United States. I won't go into that detail now because I want to start with uh, the discussion with uh, with uh, Tao. But if you now look look it up, you will see that in the last year th there is growing discussion in the United States in the, the in the toll the high toll of uh, big money in politics, in policy in the United States, in the United States, and specifically the high toll of uh, uh, concentration. Uh, the Council of Economic uh, uh, Advisor of uh, Obama uh, went out last year for the first time in, I don't know, since the days of Teddy Roosevelt with, uh, with a memo, with an analysis of what happens when you have concentration in many industries and the ramification to it, to efficiency, to prices, and even to political, uh, uh, political uh, influence. Some of the stuff that we're seeing in the, in the wages has to, do with, uh, ha has to do with it. Productivity suffers when you have concentration and when you have regulation that prevents entry and prevents, uh, 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 prevents uh, uh, competition. Thank you. So thank you guys so much. I will tell you something that Guy was modest about and not telling you. He became a TV primetime star in the last uh, two weeks. It's nothing new for him because he was already uh, sort of a star for uh, documentaries, but uh, lately the Israeli Broadcast Authority actually put on in primetime a um, chapter of uh, whatever you heard here, uh, specifically with Israeli banks. So the Israeli public, I've seen Guy, even though Guy is uh, in Chicago, we, we saw him on TV every night for probably seven to ten minutes. Yeah, uh, so talking about, uh, so maybe you start by telling us how is this experience. I mean, you're not walking in the streets of Chicago and people are stopping you, right? Yeah. That happens in Manhattan. <laughs> in Manhattan, really? Yeah. And how does it feel to be, you know, um, on Israel uh, evening primetime TV on the news? Okay, so this is, uh, this is strange because uh, what happens is actually when, the, when they put together the new broadcasting authority, uh, they called me like six or seven months ago, and the question they posed to me was the following. Guy, tell us what kind of documentary film or investigative series can be done only on public television, meaning without commercial interests in other day. And I told them, well, it is certainly, there is only one thing that is uh, obvious and is to, be, is to do uh, uh, a series on the political economy of Israel's largest bank. Banking system. Ban banking system and specifically Bank Apoalim because Bank Apoalim was tied at some point in time in the last decade to Israel's uh, largest conglomerate. And as I mentioned before, you know, the chairman is now serving, uh, just finished serving second term in jail and uh, the chairman of the conglomerate is on his way to jail. But together, uh, uh, those He's talking about the chairman of the bank, of the, the largest yeah. bank in Israel. Yeah. And why won't other Israeli commercial channels, Channel 10 and Channel 2, will not put any series regarding, let's be more specific, the Bank of Polim and his chairwoman, Sherry Arison, maybe she's a familiar name here. So that has changed throughout years. When we were, uh, when we were doing all the investigative work on the concentration and on the legal corruption and the criminal corruption that were happening in the, in the financial system and in the monopolies and cartels in Israel back six or seven or eight years, 
this was a period of time that nobody was doing. Those people were untouchables. Now, if you look at the shareholders of those uh, newspapers and shareholders of uh, television channels, you'll see that this makes a sense. They are not only big advertisers, but they also control those. So just Channel 2, which is by far the most popular channel in Israel, actually is like a, a, a syndicate that all the main shareholders are also the people that con control the biggest private monopolies. You mentioned the gas monopoly. As soon as the, uh, <coughs> Itzhak Tshuva found gas, the next thing that he did is go and joined Channel 2 as a, as a shareholder, and we can understand why. So, so, Guy, going back a uh, couple of years ago, or maybe two years ago, uh, with the gas protest and also on the social protest, your writing has changed a bit. You were a columnist. You were um, um, founder of, of, of The Demarker. But some of, the, of your writings, of your personal writings, has changed. You became more about motivating people to get out and protest. So this type of uh, journalism, you, we are here on a conference about uh, civil activation and civil uh, involvement engagement. So th this kind of writings, what brought it? Why, can you remember the first time, the first column where you changed your, the way you approached your weekly column? Yeah, so that, so that happened like six, six years ago. Uh, uh, it became more evident uh, to many people uh, two or three years ago because at that time, that point in time, people were much more interested on those uh, issues. And the reason that I started, you know, having a more of an activist uh, perspective and uh, modus operandi in, uh, in uh, media is because I was frustrated and I thought that this is high time. If Israeli media is mostly controlled by special interests, if politicians cannot bring change because they are controlled by special interest, we must mobilize uh, people. So I've been doing it for six or seven years, and in the, or maybe eight even, in the first four years, we were harshly, uh, uh, people were criticizing us very, very harshly, saying, no, 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 no. This, you can't do that. You just report, okay? And we said, no, no, just reporting, uh, does it sometimes doesn't work because many times just reporting, actually you are you are just maintaining the status quo, and not now we see that it has changed. But actually, did you go you to the protest as well? Yes, we are big part of the protest. We supported the protest, and I think for a good reason because I think that our politics, you c you can say what you want about, and you are the expert on politics in Israel. You can say what you want about Israeli politics and you, you can talk about the polarization in US politics, Israel politics, one thing is for sure, social protest was one of the biggest and the more important things that happened in Israel in terms of changing uh, 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 the agenda. And, 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 and not only changing the agenda, but you know, the uh, social, uh, 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 you know, social sector in Israel, the communities is n feel now much more potent than they did before the social uh, protest. But actually, uh, if you go back to the history of this great country, you remember that the muckraking journalist in the beginning of the 20th uh, uh, century in the Gilded Age were journalists that wanted to, this is how the progressive uh, uh, movement was created in the United States in many, and in many years. The people who brought reforms and the most important reforms that we cherish uh, 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 today in terms of protecting labor, and protecting our water, and protecting our food, and protecting our financial system. These are all reforms that were introduced in the beginning of the 20th uh, uh, centuries and were pushed by activist uh, journalists, which were, were called uh, the muckraker uh, journalists. So uh, y you wrote a lot about the anti-concentration bill and then the gas protest and um, the cell market, which you mentioned in your what do you think is going to be, um, you know, what is your writing going to be focused on next uh, as a big theme? Are you going to be focused, what do you think is the next big um, thing for Israel? Is it the banking system? Is it the housing crisis? And what are you going to focus your writing, your personal agenda-driven get-out-to-protest writings? So I think that the biggest challenge today 
uh, and this is U.S. and Israel, it's the same f story. I think that what happened is that the polarization between the right and left in Israel has deteriorated dramatically, uh, has the polarization increased dramatically. And what happens actually that we are now in dynamics that everything that is there on the agenda, people, the first question would be, who is supporting it, who is against it? Once, now, if we support Netanyahu and Netanyahu supports it, we are there. If it's the left, we are there. This is as journalists are, now, it is very easy for politicians and for journalists to join this, okay? This is like a circus. This is like Fox and CNN. It's a circus. It's not journalism. And it's very easy for us to enjoy that cir circus. Especially but when Trump is on the show. Uh, Trump is S making this so uh, much fun. Uh, uh, circus so much fun. In the United States, it's, you know, he's making it non not only uh, so much fun, but he's al also making it so profitable. <laughs> Both, uh, you know, it, the entire media, uh, most media outlets, whether it's television or even print, even print newspapers in the United States are now uh, enjoying this uh, uh, circus. If we rely ourselves to treat uh, politics and media as a circus of always right and left and don't deal with the issues themselves, we're in big trouble. Okay. I think um, you, you show me the sign. I have to take questions from the audience right now, or is there one more question for me? I'll ask just one more question, and then we'll do audience. That's fine? Okay. My last question, maybe I hope I'll get the most interesting answer, is the, the marker has been very effective in uh, influencing politicians. Do they call you personally? Do is the finance minister call call up call you and you know uh, wants to know your opinion? I think, for me, knowing politicians, they are, f are afraid of what's going to be written in a Harvard or the market the next the next morning, uh, especially in the gas. Uh, I thought I thought in the gas protest it was very obvious. So how many calls do you get a week? And what you know? Tell us what you tell the finance minister how to solve the housing crisis. So I have a lot of uh, <laughs> ups and downs with... Tell uh, us your sources. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I have a lot of ups and downs with Israeli uh, uh, politicians, specifically with the Ministry of Finance, the current Ministry of Finance. It is no secret that I, uh, uh, I introduced him to the uh, ideas of bringing competition in the mobile market seven years ago, and he decided to bet the entire farm on this thing. Mm -hmm. And he won big time because he became very popular. And I also uh, uh, sort of helped him in thinking about what to do in the banking system. But uh, when it came to the gas monopoly, we know that he failed us uh, uh, miserably. And unfortunately, I had to criticize them very harshly. He's not talking to you anymore? Two years. Uh, I won't comment on <laughs> whether we talk a lot or not, <laughs> but I can tell you that uh, it's a very, uh, how would I say it, okay, a we were just rocky relationship. About, we were talking about Kahlon, to those of you who are not familiar with the name. So let me uh, take some question. Uh, we have a headline, Kahlon is not talking to Ronik anymore. Or he is talking to Ronik, I don't know. Anyways, um, anyone wants to ask a question? Yep, um, please, Professor. Uh, very nice talk and great interview. And I wanted to touch upon the issue that you raised regarding uh, the gas. Uh, if you could comment on specifically uh, Israel uh, current activities in terms of uh, deals that uh, they have reached with uh, Jordan and Turkey, and what does it really mean uh, from your perspective, not just on the economic uh, situation, but also uh, the geopolitical uh, climate between Israel and those countries? So <coughs> I'll start with, with the economic uh, uh, issues. The big problem today with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the gas situation in Israel is that uh, we pay, we, the Israeli public, pay double the, mark, the, the real uh, market, uh, the market price. I don't want to go into details, but if anybody here is, uh, is in finance, so the internal rate of return that the, that, the, uh, uh, that the gas monopoly gets today is more than 30%, which is crazy. And 15 is more than adequate to recoup all investments and be a very important. So 
the gas monopoly in Israel is, uh, is a joint venture by an Israeli company and an American company called Nobel. And Nobel is a public company, and they have to disclose everything in their financial statements. And actually, until two years ago, they wrote, this is the most profitable uh, exploration that we ever had. We are doing here much better than any country that we had. And this is because of the failure of, uh, of the policy. On the other question, I'm not an expert on it. You know, I, you know, I don't want to, uh, to uh, go to territories where, you know, to ge geopolitical. But what I would tell you is that many, many times, it is it is because the world of geopolitics, international relations is so complicated, and there's so many narratives, and it changes all the time. Very easy to use geopolitical international relations excuses when you want to push something for your internal reasons or for economic reasons. So I would be very wary to think that we are doing what wherever we're doing in terms of our gas uh, policy because this is the way that we are going to strike a peace accord with Turkey or whatever. Um, yes, please, over there. Hi. Thanks. First of all, thank you very much. I think it was very interesting. And my question is, you probably Maybe you can speak up. Yeah. Uh, you probably wrote, I don't know, a thousand, a few thousand of articles. I'm from Israel. How do you persuade the right wing? To listen to you? How do I? Persuade the right wing to listen to your articles. So this is a very sore point. I'm so sorry we are on record. <laughs> so actually, what happened is that for many years, although, you know, so the marker actually is, uh, is a newspaper that I founded 16 years ago, but it's now part of RH, which is very left-wing newspapers. But until four or five years ago, we were able to convince many people on the right, and especially the Netanyahu government, in our policy, in our ideas. And we are able to have a discussion of right and left, which was uh, nonpartisan. <coughs> in the last two years, we are failing here big time. It is much more difficult to have any kind of discussion in Israel which is not partisan. So the gas is a great example. Why? I've been writing about the importance of competition and the threat and harm of monopolies, private monopolies, the public monopolies, and crony capitalism for 10 years. And many of the people actually that supported us vehemently were people on the right. And of course, some of the ideas that we brought to bear that uh, were implemented by the Netanyahu government. What happened in the last two years, in the gas monopoly as a case in point, is that people positioned, branded, and framed the issue of the gas monopoly as an issue of right versus left. If you're attacking the gas monopoly, you are attacking the right-wing government. And it worked. All of a sudden, you see people who were for competition People who are conservative and believe in competition, believe in open markets, all of a sudden, when, because it is now framed as a partisan issue, say, no, you know what? When it comes to gas, we like monopolies. Why? Because now gas monopoly becomes something of the right. So this is addressing uh, Tal's uh, question again. This is our biggest challenge now. How do we come out of this wicked, harmful equilibrium, that everything is just right or left or, or uh, partisan. Um, I think we don't have any more time for more questions. Okay, thank you so much.